Members of uh, council, ladies and gentlemen, the clerk advises me that it is now seven o'clock, so I will call this uh, council meeting to order. And I would ask you please to stand and join with me in a moment of silent reflection on our national anthem. Madam uh, Clerk, are there any agenda announcements and or amendments? Thank you. There is uh, just an addendum, item four and items for consideration is renumbered as item five, and that a new item number four is introduced with respect to waiving the rules of procedure. I uh, thank you. Are there any disclosure by any member of council this evening? Being none. Uh, Councillor Chalner uh, has been in touch uh, with the uh, clerk's department. He's under the weather, uh, so he's not feeling well, so he'll not be with us uh, this evening, but we do have a uh, quorum and we will uh, proceed. Resolution moved by Councillor Best and seconded by Councillor Melville and be it resolved the consent items numbers one to five be approved. Are there any one of these that any member of council wish pulled out and dealt with separately? Council Best? Item three. Three. Any other uh, item that any member wish pulled out and dealt with separately? If not, Council Best, number three. Yeah, just a question to staff regarding the uh, bus acquisition. I uh, note that this is part of a uh, joint tender that we do with other uh, municipalities. In the interest of uh, the environmental uh, concerns that were raised uh, last year, yeah, how will we go about requesting uh, quotes for other types of buses, such as uh, electric buses, which Guelph is buying, or hydrogen or other uses, that uh, basically we could look at comparisons in terms of capital and operating costs uh, rather than the diesel buses? Thank you. Uh, and again, Mr. Cowan or Mr. Brophy, I'm not sure, Mr. Brophy, you might be the best to address Councillor Best's question. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we, we've been um, investigating electric buses. At this point in time, this is a Metrolinx um, tender uh, that is uh, um, called for all the municipalities in Ontario. Um, so we've been investigating and, and electric buses are not available through that tender. Um, so we've been investigating electric buses. We didn't want to go straight to um, uh, biodiesel. We don't want to. We don't want to go straight to uh, uh, compressed natural gas, um, CNG. Um, so I think the jump that we're looking to make is straight from diesel to electric. 
Mr. Best. Yeah, thank you. I just ask the staff uh, pursue these alternatives and, and basically have a both capital and operating expense comparison so we can actually look at, you know, tenders because I could see more municipalities. I think some of the uh, uh, councillors had a ride on some of the electric buses at the FCM and uh, AMO uh, you know, conferences and they are getting very close in terms of comparisons and, and both costs. So uh, I'd hope that we see a tender that we can compare both uh, the either electric, compressed air or hydrogen. Certainly uh, concur with that uh, thought, uh, for sure. Is there any further on item number three? If not, you've heard the, uh, the motion. Uh, those in favor, the motion. And that's carried. Councillor uh, Hamid uh, is the acting mayor and he will be assuming the uh, chair for the uh, portion of the Committee of the Whole, so Councillor uh, Hamid, if you'd get prepared to assume the uh, the Chair. Uh, Madam Clerk, is there anything that we have forgot in Council? This Council meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we'll now move on to the public meeting. Uh, I have staff report PD00520, public meeting and initial report zoning bylaw amendment application by 9980 Dairy Holdings, Inc. Applicant, applicable to lands known municipal, municipally as 9980 Dairy Road, West Milton. Uh, this is now the public meeting portion of our agenda. Just as a reminder, council will not make the final decision today. Uh, anyone who would like to be informed when the final report will be going to council or anyone who wishes to speak but is not a registered delegate, please fill out the register located just outside the council chamber doors. This is the public meeting under Planning Act for Zoning Bylaw Amendment application by 9980 Daily Holdings, Inc. Applicable to lands known municipally as 9980 Dairy Road, West Milton. So is there anyone other than the representative of the applicant or uh, the applicants himself or themselves in the audience who would like to speak in this matter? Can you let me know if any member of the audience would like to speak? Okay, just, just hold on for a second. Thank you. All right, so in that case, uh, the purpose of this meeting, public meeting, is to receive input on the proposed development applications. The staff is aware of the issues raised by the public when completing the evaluation of the proposal. Staff will be taking detailed notes, however, will not be responding to questions except to provide clarification regarding the process or points of fact. Staff will respond to any questions raised as part of the future technical report with recommendations. Is the applicant or the representative in the audience and would you like to speak? Do you want to come up and just, uh, please come up, thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and area residents. My name is Sarah Clark. I'm a planner with Glen Schnarr and Associates, an authorized agent for the registered property owner. I'll be providing a brief presentation to you tonight on the proposal of the application before you. Tonight's application is an application to amend the zoning bylaw to permit a two-story day nursery use. 
The site is generally located on the southwest corner of Dairy Road and Fourth Line. Located generally to the south is a natural feature which has been considered as a part of this application. There's no development proposed within the boundary of the natural feature or within the associated buffer area. Located to the east is an existing residential and located to the west there's existing residential and institutional uses. The town's official plan designates the property as residential. The proposed use is permitted under the residential designation of the official plan. In the approved Bristol Survey secondary plan, there are more detailed land use permissions prescribed for the subject plans. The secondary plan also designates the property as residential. The proposed use is permitted also under the secondary plan designation and therefore there is no official plan amendment required as a part of this application. In order to permit for the proposal, a zoning bylaw amendment, however, is required. We have worked with the Town of Milton staff throughout the preliminary meeting process and following a first submission to determine the appropriate zone. The current zoning is future development in residential low density. We are proposing a minor institutional zone marked as IA, AAA, on the image in front of you. In order to accommodate for the unique characteristics of the proposal, a special exception zone is proposed. This will allow relief to certain zoning bylaw requirements, including but not limited to reduced setbacks, minimum lot area, and the location of the accessory features. In order to address and assess the merit of the proposal, the Town of Milton has required the proponent to submit various technical studies and drawings. These are set out before you. These studies help to determine the feasibility of the proposal in terms of planning, engineering, urban design, among other matters. Before you now is the original concept plan for the day nursery, which was submitted as a part of the application formally made on September 25, 2019. This was also the site concept plan that was presented at the, in the privately initiated public meeting on December 12th, 2019. At this meeting, we received various comments from area residents and other interested parties. Notable concerns were laid out in front of you. This includes access from fourth line, increased traffic at peak hours, on-street parking along fourth line, noise from the outdoor play area, view shreds from fourth line to the natural feature, building orientation and configuration, and the location of the outdoor play area. We've also had the chance to have discussions with staff from the region of Halton and the town of Milton. Notable discussion items include the road widening along Dairy Road and the associated daylight triangle, and the possibility for a secondary access to be accommodated from Dairy Road. We took the comments that were offered through the public meeting and those obtained directly from staff as a part of their formal review of the original application. We prepared the revised concept plan that is shown in front of you. As mentioned, we have a new secondary access being proposed from Dairy Road. We wish to note that this requires further engagement with the region of Peel, the region of Halton, and we look forward to advancing this discussion in the near future. At this time, we are working with the applicant and staff to address the resident comments that we received at the public meeting in December. The site is approximately 0.29 hectares or approximately 0.71 acres in size post land dedications. The development proposal consists of a two-story daycare building with the associated play areas. There's a total gross floor area of 1,330 square meters proposed between the two stories. This represents a lot coverage of approximately 23%. The play areas will be designed with, with uh, toy storage areas and play structures and will be fenced around the perimeter. At this time, there are 45 parking spaces proposed to accommodate the development proposal. The development is also proposed to accommodate a total of 330 children and 45 staff members. The following slides are proposed elevations and preliminary views. This elevation is a perspective from Dairy Road looking south. Similarly, this elevation is a perspective looking southwest from Dairy. You can see fourth line just in the left-hand corner there. <clears throat> the graphic on my left is a perspective from Dairy Road. The two graphics on the right are views from Dairy near fourth line. 
Conclusively, we are of the opinion that the daycare nursery use will continue to contribute to the creation of complete and healthy communities within the existing area and cater to the planned future of the surrounding communities. We feel that the land use is compatible in use in its form and efficiently puts to use an otherwise underutilized parcel of land. We thank you for your time and consideration of our development proposal. At this time, we would be happy to take any questions or hear any additional comments that residents or staff may have. Um, please note that we do have our traffic consultant here to answer any technical related questions, and we look forward to advancing this development proposal in the future with staff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll do council comments and uh, debate later, but if you have any questions of clarification from the presenter, Councillor Best. Yes, uh, just one to uh, the delegation and one further to uh, staff later. I noticed you have a, a name of the daycare operator there. Are they experienced in this type of operation of a large daycare? I just wanted to, you know, not everybody's uh, mm -hmm. familiar with the daycares these days. Yes, absolutely. Um, they are very familiar. They operate several sites across the GTA right now, and they are have active applications to open several more, actually. Thank you. They are here in the audience if you'd like to hear from them as well. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any other council members? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, so I, I noticed that members of public uh, wanted to speak, so this is your opportunity. Uh, is If anyone wants wishes to speak, can you please let me know on this issue? Any member of public on this issue interested in speaking? Yeah, please come up, ma'am. And if you can please state your name and address clearly for the record, the floor is yours. Okay, my name is Peggy Lyon. I live at 621 Fourth Line, Milton. Okay, so my concerns are this, um, hello everyone, I, this is my first time here, so I don't quite know the procedure. But um, my residence is almost opposite where the stake here is gonna be. So I have a couple concerns um, that I have submitted already to Aaron, um, and I just wanted to read my points out again. Okay, so some of my points that I am considering is preference that the entrance and exit driveway not be on fourth line, but rather you keep the existing driveway off Derry Road. The proposed driveway entry to the new building previously was only on fourth line. The street would be way too busy at drop off and pick up times. Since the inside parking lot provides parking for four, 47 cars, half of that would be used for staff and with the 300 plus children, the staff would be at least six kids to one adult, therefore 20 to 30 adults. There would not be enough room inside the parking for parents. Therefore, parents with cars would have to park on fourth line and walk their children in. Furthermore, the cars would be turning back and forth in and out of our driveways, obstructing pedestrians and car traffic. Another point is there is already a lineup of cars in the morning at rush hour waiting to exit fourth line onto Derry Road. It would be impossible to have a drop-off area included in that same space. I understand that the drop off and pick up times would be staggered, which would cause traffic to be continuous and worse during the day. This area would be too busy with daytime traffic on a two lane road. This is a quiet residential area and with the proposed two outside parking playground areas bounded on fourth line, there would be too much outside noise coming from the 300 plus children as other residents and we would be disturbed during the quiet day. The noise would travel through the open area and onto the surrounding areas on fourth line. There is already a daycare further down the street on fourth line. That's just another point I needed to make. Um, there's also a public li Milton Public Library on fourth line. This library has after school programs and fourth line gets quite busy again at drop off and pick up times. We do not need an additional commercial business that would add to that traffic. One of the reasons that we, the neighbors, bought our homes here on fourth line was because it's a quiet street and there is only a right turn in and out onto Derry with no access from east of Derry. 
the plans mentioned for widening the intersection at Fourth Line and Derry. Where would that land come from for this widening? And again, that would amount to excessive traffic on Fourth Line. This is a quiet residential street and we do not want any widening. In addition, Fourth Line provides street parking opposite to our homes for our house guests. Since we all have only single car garages and very limited driveway space, most of our home guests and definitely need to use street parking day and night. We also need to move our cars in and out in the morning to free up space for our other cars to come out of the garage. We park our cars on fourth line. With the pro proposed driveway off fourth line, there would be no parking from the corner of Derry down fourth line to the proposed new driveway. Where would we and our guests park? Furthermore, there would be no parking signs put along fourth line from Derry to Beatty Trail. Note, this was done after the Marquet townhomes were built further down on fourth line. We do not want our area of fourth line to be changed to no parking, like what was done further down the street. The street parking is to be kept for residents and our guests only. This area is a private residential area and there has already been changes done within the last three years by adding the Colera original origin condos across the creek, which block westward views. This two-story building would, would further commercialize the private residential area. Taking the two portions of land designated as part of the natural heritage system for building commercial purposes is not good for the natural environment, as small animals and birds would lose their natural homes. We are opposed to the site being changed and rezoned from residential low density to local commercial zoning. We strongly object to the proposed two-story daycare being built at Derry and Fourth Line. I now have some suggestions, just a couple. It is noted that the building would be built wrapped around the corner of Derry to Fourth Line with the entrance of Fourth Line. We would suggest that the wrapping of the building be changed to more along Fourth Line wrapping to Derry, therefore allowing the existing driveway to be utilized off Derry. With the widening of Derry in, with the widening of the Derry in 2031, the building footprint should be smaller, as land will have to be taken from the existing Derry Road frontage. To enable the driveway to be off Derry, while land is being taken from the existing frontage of Derry, an, ex an exclusive turn lane can be made off Derry, so as to facilitate traffic turning into the facility from Derry Road. Therefore, there would be no backup of traffic on Derry, this would be a faster turnaround for parents dropping off and continuing along Derry. With the building wrapping around from Fourth Line to Derry Road, this way the proposed two play areas would be on the inside of the building, not visible to Fourth Line or Derry, as the proposed plans are now. The children would be kept safe and away from visual sight of proposed unwanted gawkers. Also, the noise level from the playground would be towards the creek area and not to the residents on fourth line. This would be a better view of nature and a more common area for the children to play in. This can only be accomplished if the entrance is kept on Derry and no entrance or exit being placed on fourth line. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you could just stay up for just one second until I see if any members of council have any questions or clarification. Seeing none, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I saw one more hand at least. Uh, is there any other member of public who wishes to speak on this topic? Yes, please come up. Mirat Maurice, 826 Gifford Crescent Milton. Um, I'm one of the RECE who works in Lullaboo already, but the Lullaboo Mississauga. And not only me, a couple of us will be like reducing the traffic if we work close to home and walking distance. So there will be no more traffic on dairy from a couple of us at least. 
So that will really help to have us near home. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Seeing no questions, yes, please come up. I live in Milton. If you can state uh, your name and address, please. Yes. Uh, I live in Milton, uh, Bronte, and I have to go. I work in Mississauga location. I have to drive every day to Mississauga. When they open here, I can't come to work. Yeah, that's it. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, so we'll take the name later. Uh, any other member of the public? Yes, ma'am, please come up. If you can please state your name and address for the record before you speak. Okay, my name is Claudia Varela and my address is 650 South Street. Uh, I live here in Milton too and I work here uh, now. I'm working in Mississauga. Then if they open the daycare, I have to, I can walk to my work because it's, it's close to my condo. I live in the, the condos close to the area. Thank you. Any questions for the delegate? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Flora Watts. My residence is 611 Fourth Line. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I wanted to just um, uh, acknowledge what Peggy said. Her plan is exactly how the residents, uh, myself and my other uh, residents feel about the uh, proposed daycare on fourth line. I also wanted to add that um, having people uh, live close to work is absolutely fantastic, that's good, but people change all the time. So while they may be uh, working or have, have a job for a short uh, period of time, we as residents are there for the duration. We bought our house, our homes, because we had a um, conservation area right across the street from us, and all the residents on fourth line, uh, that was the main reason why we bought our homes. And this is going to be a tremendous change from why we bought our homes. It's also going to um, perhaps cause a, decline, a, a lowering of our property values. And so what I'd like to say is that um, the uh, proposal that Peggy spoke about is how the residents feel and I just want to reinforce that. And thank you for that. Just, uh, is there any question? Seeing none, thank you very much. Any other member of the public in, uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Beryl Bursa and I live on uh, Evans Terrace. Um, I'm a resident here in Milton, but I also have my daughter that needs to go to daycare and I think it's a great idea to have the daycare right across the street from us. Thank you. Short and sweet, thank you very much. Uh, any other member of the public? Seeing then, going the second time. Third and final time, okay, thank you. Uh, so as there are no more speakers, I will We'll move on to the staff recommendation. Be resolved that planning and development report PD0025-20 be received for information. Uh, any members of council, council at best? Yes, if possible, we could have the original uh, site plan map up, the one showing the neighboring properties, if that's uh, feasible. Okay, just to go, just a question to uh, planning staff. Uh, I noticed on this uh, the view that was uh, given to us, it's, I believe it's figure yeah, figure one here. What is the uh, plans, or if there is any applications on the north side, I believe it's, uh, yeah, there it is, the uh, two uh, field areas. Is there any plans or applications or anything that uh, staff knows about happening there? Because that's our uh, hole in the donut for uh, Milton. It's, uh, everything else has been built around it, but that's left over except for the new uh, French uh, Catholic school to the uh, north. And my concern is, as raised by the residents here, is we're going to have more traffic, but uh, this is nothing compared to what could happen on the north side. Who wants to take that one? Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll have to uh, verify the uh, land use designation. My recollection is that it is um, 
residential office, so it does allow for a mix of uses. Uh, in addition, uh, the lands to the north will complete the, the channel, the hole in the donut, as, as we call it. Um, but so there will be, a, I believe it's 75 meters wide uh, channel continuing down south to Derry and then connecting across the subject lands. But that immediate corner, uh, I believe, is designated for residential office. To your knowledge, is there any applications for either of these properties? Through you, Mr. Chairman, no, there are not any uh, present applications. Okay, this is my uh, concern, uh, Mr. Chairman, as residents highlighted <clears throat> the traffic, as uh, some of you might remember, we had a bit of a controversy when the uh, fourth line was closed. Actually, I think Councillor Malbuff and the Mayor were the only ones who were around at that time. And my concern, if you do build on that north uh, corner, what is the future designation for fourth line and Derry Road? And just a question to the engineering director. Uh, would you recommend reinstalling a, a four-way intersection and possibly traffic lights? Because I can see the resident's concern. It's okay if you're heading you know, to the east, but if you're heading to the west, good luck trying to make a left-hand turn at rush hours. So could I get an idea from staff? If development does occur to the north, would staff be recommending reopening a fourth line or Cedar Hedge Road and putting traffic lights there? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so fourth line was closed a um, number of years ago. Um, because it didn't go through anymore because of the rail. We discontinued the uh, level crossing at the railway. Um, I, we could take that into consideration and, and take a look at it. Um, I don't have an answer for you right now. Thank you, Mike. My concern, Mr. Chairman, if you look at this map, the area to the green on the uh, west side of Cedar Hedge is now about a 500 student school. And that's the concern I've had from some of the parents there that, you know, it is very difficult for them to come and go from that new school. And having, you know, fourth line of Cedar Hedge open would, you know, improve things there. I know it wouldn't improve things for the people in fourth line and Cedar Hedge, but we have to look at the overall community. And that's a concern I ask that staff look at, you know, what's happening in this area and make sure that, you know, I, I can see some of the benefits of having a daycare here, but I could also see the obstacles. So I hope to see a balanced report. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Councillor Cluett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of questions uh, regarding um, to staff and, and hopefully uh, the proponent will have an opportunity or, or wish an opportunity to speak as well. I don't know, or would we ask for them to have an up if they have a few words or be subject to questions because um, a couple one of the questions I had uh, I'll ask and then we'll figure out that sounds good uh, one of the residents brought up re uh, rejigging the site re sort of twisting the building around to face a different direction and uh, that would require the opening for Derry Road to be a right in right out access for that uh, can anybody on staff comment uh, the feasibility of that or if that is a possibility yeah Commissioner uh, Koopman through you, Mr. Chairman, um, Derry Road is a regional road, so under their jurisdiction, and we would have to consult with regional staff. Typically, uh, regional staff or regional policy has been to direct um, full movement access from the side roads and not directly onto uh, regional roads. And I guess this is where my question to the proponent would be: with uh, looking at all the different options, uh, they did hold they did hold a, uh, a public information session for residents not too long ago uh, to get all of this input from the residents, so I thank them for that. Uh, through those deliberations, have you looked at the concept or the idea of moving that building around to accommodate? Would, would it be possible for you to move that if uh, an opening onto Derry Road was uh, possible? Uh, if you wish to come up, you can. I don't want to make you, but uh, I think that's, a lot of that will be answered as part of the technical report once that comes forward. So I think we'll have uh, staff take the advice and look into it and come back as part of the technical report. Yeah, my, my intent wasn't to put anybody on the spot on that. I just wanted to see if that was a feasibility of, of, of one of the options. Uh, another resident brought up parking on fourth line, uh, and I'm going to ask um, our commissioner to look at um, uh, the way parking is currently structured along fourth line south of Derry Road. Uh, I know that on one side, as you go south on Derry Road, the parking, the no parking or the uh, limited parking uh, switches sides from uh, the east side to the west side. 
what is the current makeup of our park, no parking along that road? And are there any plans to make any changes? Is, is the question that you want us to take a look at the uh, parking along fourth line? That's part of the, that's, that's where I'm trying to get to because I know that on one side, uh, for a certain distance on fourth line, there's parking on the east side or the west side of the road and on the other side, as you go further down, the, the no par uh, parking is on the uh, west side of the road. So it, it, it differs. Is there a plan to make it, uh, to change that at all? Or is there a plan to review that to make sure it continues on with the uniformity? The, there, there, I, I know there is some logic to to the way the parking is set up on the fourth line, but for the life of me, it escapes me at this point in time. So I'd have to go back and talk to our staff about that. Thanks very much. That's all I have right now. All right. Thank you, Councilor Kluwit. Uh, Councilor Tessa Dirksen. Thank you. Wondering uh, if there are plans in the foreseeable future to widen fourth line. Um, there is nothing in our capital plan that widens fourth line. I think it's pretty much set in width. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I have no more speakers. Anyone else? Seeing then, just as a reminder, council is not making a decision tonight. Staff have taken notes of all the concerns raised, and they'll come back with a technical report. So if you wish to be notified, please make sure your name's under register or right by the entrance, and that way staff will contact you when the technical report's coming forward. Uh, so seeing no one else, uh, councillors, the motion's on the floor. All in favor? Carries. All right, next report is a presentation, ranked voting presentation. So I'll call on Megan Reed, Director of Legislative and Legal Services for a presentation. And I'll be timing you myself. Thank you. Um, Chair and members of council, um, you may be wondering with this presentation this evening, um, why are we discussing this topic and why are we discussing this topic now? Um, so there's two answers to that. So as a result of the Municipal Elections Modernization Act 2016, ranked ballot voting is an option for council to consider for the 2022 municipal election. So due to the logistic and communication implications for implementing a new voting system, we wanted to start this conversation with council early. Uh, we are not looking for a direction, a recommendation um, from Council this evening. Um, at this point, it's just an information presentation. Uh, staff will be coming forward at a future date with a staff report with a recommendation, but the intent of the presentation tonight is just to provide an overview of what ranked ballot, ballot voting looks like, the legislative requirements, as well as some considerations that Council and staff um, may want to keep in mind in the development of staff report that I indicated again will be coming forward at a future date. Um, during this presentation, I will be using the terminology ranked ballot voting just to be consistent with the Ontario legislation, but it is also referred to as ranked choice voting, or you may see it referred to as instant runoff voting as well. So just some background. So first past the post electoral system has been used in Canada for federal, provincial, and until recently uh, for all municipal elections. So beginning in 2018, municipalities in Ontario have the option to use ranked ballot voting for council elections, as I indicated previously, as a result of the Municipal Elections Modernization Act that was passed um, in 2016. Um, while other parts of the world, such as Ireland, Australia, um, some cities in the US, um, as well as party leadership elections, have used ranked ballot voting um, in the past, the City of London, Ontario was the first on municipality in Canada to use ranked ballot voting. Um, and I can say from experience um, that clerks uh, in Ontario were very curious about this and are very interested in learning from London's experience in 2018. 
Uh, in 2018, the cities of Kingston and Cambridge um, did not implement ranked ballot voting, but they did opt to put a question on the ballot to allow electors to vote on using ranked ballot voting in future. So I just wanted to note that the result of a question on the ballot is only binding if at least 50% of the eligible electors vote on the question and if a majority of those voters vote in favour. So in both of those communities, the results were not binding, but I'm sure that they will be taking that feedback into consideration as they look at the 2022 municipal election. So just a review of the first past the post voting system. Uh, so that is currently used in the town of Milton. It's a winner take all model where the elected office is reflected in the majority's first choice. So the candidate that wins the highest number of votes wins the right to represent that particular office. The winner does not need an absolute majority, which is more than 50% of the votes cast for office. Some claims made in support of first past the post could be that it's easy to understand. It obviously has familiarity for uh, voters um, in our area particularly, um, and that uh, ballots could be more easily counted is another claim that could be made in support for first past the post. So ranked ballot voting, as I indicated, which also can be referred to as ranked choice voting or instant runoff, uh, allows voters to rank candidates in order of preference for a particular office. Uh, so, for example, voting for the office of mayor, a voter could rank one or more candidates for that office. Ranked ballots allow a voter to express additional preferences if their first choice is eliminated in the first or in a later round of counting. Um, so we have a video here, um, and thanks to NPR News, which is an American source that we found, uh, we thought that this was a very simple explanation of ranked ballot voting, or ranked choice voting as they refer to it. Um, and so if you'll indulge us, we'll just show that video now. Pick your favorite color. The ranked choice voting one. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, I want blue. And if neither of those wins, I guess I can live with orange. Now, let's count up everybody's votes. Under ranked choice voting rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority more than 50% of the votes. Purple's ahead, but it has only seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate the color in last place. Sorry, orange fans, we're going to your second choice. Two more for green. One for purple. But no color has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye bye, bye blue. One more for purple. Four for green. And we have a winner. The Ranked Choice Voting Way. So again, uh, we want to thank NPR News for that, um, which is a video that we, we located. And we felt, felt that it was a very simple explanation of the concept of uh, ranked ballot voting. So with respect to the ranked ballot counting process, and that's what that might look like in a municipal election, um, it starts with the polls closing after voting. The ballots are counted. If a candidate for office has received 50% plus one of the votes, they are declared the winner. If not, the candidate who has received the fewest votes is eliminated and a new count begins. The ballots, the ballots that rank the eliminated candidate as first choice are now counted again, but this time using the second choice votes. This process is repeated until a winner can be declared with 50% plus one of the vote. So as I noted previously, um, the City of London did implement um, ranked ballot voting in the 2018 municipal election, and we would just like to show uh, one of the videos that they produced um, for their voters in 2018. Ranked choice voting, but what is it and how does it really work? With ranked choice, you just vote for one candidate. You vote for your first, second, and third choices. After all the votes are counted, if one of the candidates gets 50% of the first place votes plus one, they win. But if no one gets 50% of the votes plus one, the candidate with the least amount of votes is eliminated. Then the second choice votes from that candidate are now counted and added to the remaining candidates' totals. The candidate on the right gets 50% plus one of the vote, and we have a winner. Uh, 
Um, so this would be one of the many education and communication tools used by the City of London in the 2018 municipal election. This is also an infographic that's been used um, by municipalities in order to explain the ranked ballot voting process. Um, so with regard to ranked ballot design, we wanted to provide a couple of designs for Council's information just so that you may see what this would look like. Um, the design of the ballot is the responsibility of the clerk in conducting the municipal election, but we just wanted to provide uh, a couple of samples. Uh, so in this sample, we, we delved into a very controversial topic of favorite fruit. Um, and as you can see, we had uh, the choices available by columns. And then in this second ballot design, um, the candidates are listed along the left-hand side with the choices in columns to the right. So there are obviously um, likely very um, varying perspectives on ranked ballot voting. Um, so we wanted to just review some of the claims made in support uh, of ranked ballots as, as well as some that could be made um, in opposition. Um, so thank you to the City of London and other municipalities who have, have done some of this research and shared this with municipalities. But there are claims that it could reduce strategic voting, um, specifically um, there are claims that with first past the post, a voter may be more likely to vote for a candidate with a greater chance of winning rather than their preferred choice. Um, and it, the claim is that uh, this could re reduce this type of voting. It could reduce negative campaigning um, for opposing candidates wishing to uh, have the support of their, uh, their opposing candidate as, as their second choice. Um, so that is another claim that's, that's made in, su in support of ranked ballot voting. Uh, there's a claim that it could result in a winning candidate better reflecting the desires of the majority of the voters, but I know that that also is an argument that is made for first past the post. Um, could encourage more candidates to remain in the race until voting day without threat of vote splitting between like-minded candidates. But as you know, with municipal elections, there is a specific nomination period in which that would need to take place. So why not rank ballot voting? So there, there could be some claims um, made against using rank ballots. So increased cost due to new technology, creating new ballots and communicating changes to the voting process. So as I indicated, it does exist within some places. So the technology does exist, but um, implementing uh, new technology, new ballots um, in a new community um, could likely have some increased costs um, for that implementation. Uh, it could be said that it's a new way of voting in Ontario, which has currently only been tested once in municipal elections. Um, and that may be that someone may, might think that what works in one community may not necessarily work in another. In another excuse me. Uh, there could be a claim that it's a complicated process, since some offices would still be elected using the first-past-the-post system, such as school board trustee and possibly regional chair. So under the legislation, uh, school board trustees um, which are also elected during municipal elections, need to use the first-past-the-post system. Uh, with regard to the regional chair, or the upper-tier chair, um, the regional chair is, is directly elected by voters in the four lower-tier municipalities. So in order for ranked ballot voting to be used for the regional chair, all four lower-tier municipalities would need to approve using ranked ballots. So it would be the town of Milton, Halton Hills, Oakville, and Burlington. If at that time that all four municipalities supported using ranked ballot, then the upper tier would have an opportunity to consider, um, but it wouldn't be mandatory. So there are some implications for the ballot as well as for um, the complexity. So with regard to making a decision regarding ranked ballots, um, before passing a bylaw to switch to using ranked ballots, the council must hold a two-step consultation, so an open house to provide information and a public meeting to hear feedback, and this is a legislative requirement. Uh, during the consultation, there are also legislative requirements for what needs to be communicated at these meetings, so information about how ranked ballot elections work and how the votes are counted, an estimate of how much ranked ballot elections would cost, a description of any vote counting equipment, and voting equipment that's being considered, and a description of any alternative voting method being considered for use in the election. So passing a bylaw, um, the deadline for council to pass a bylaw would be May 1st, the year before the election. So in the case of the 2022 municipal election, it would be May 1st, 2021. And once the bylaw is passed, ranked ballots must be used for all of the seats on council. So both mayor and council, not one or the other. 
And lastly, um, I touched on some of these, but just some considerations uh, to keep in mind um, while the staff report and recommend recommendation um, are being developed and will be brought forward at, at a future date. Um, additional costs and resourcing would likely be required for consultation, education, and communication related to potential increased vendor costs, additional staffing, and communication. Counting the ballots would likely take longer than counting the votes in a traditional election, so voters may have to wait a little while longer for the unofficial results. Um, the City of London, the Office of Mayor results were announced by 2 p.m. the next day. Intensive education and communication would be required, so education and communication is key with any election. Um, but with implementation of ranked ballot voting, there would need to be specialized messaging in addition to the regular uh, election messaging that would need to be uh, communicated out. Um, so next steps, as I indicated, staff will bring forward a report and a recommendation for Council's consideration at a future meeting, which will include options and costs. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And if there are any questions that come about after this Council meeting, um, members of Council are welcome to reach out to me and we will strive to include those within the forthcoming report. Oh, we do have some questions, thank you. Uh, Councillor DiLorenzo. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I, I had a question regarding what comes first. So I saw that a future report will come back with a recommendation and listing some options. Um, and also mentioned the need for a public open house and a public meeting. So when the report comes to Council with a recommendation, is that recommendation going to be um, saying one either used ranked ballots or first past the post, or the recommendation include you know first have some type of public consultation before recommendation on which voting system to use. Because um, I, I was hoping we could have some more public feedback before uh, a recommendation leading us down a certain path. So thank you. Um, as I indicated, the staff report is still being developed as well as that recommendation. Um, as far as options, um, it could be um, you know, looking at continuing to stick with first past the post. It could be moving towards maybe a question on the ballot or moving forward with implementing ranked ballot voting. Um, we can take that into consideration. But again, if there was, uh, was an amendment um, to that, we could work to have some consultation prior to that decision being made by council. Uh, thank you, because it, it was my preference, I'd prefer having some type of public consultation prior to a recommendation on which voting system to not make that public open house or public meeting and, and after the fact uh, thing. Thank you. Councillor Tessa Dirksen. Yeah, just wondering as far as the legislation uh, requirements for changing this, um, if we did go to a new system and it was a disaster. Is it the same process to switch back to first past the post? Thank you. So my understanding would be like with any alternative voting method or vote counting equipment, that council would need to revisit that and make a decision um, with each uh, election, um, which would entail um, an open house and public meeting. Right, Councillor Best. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your uh, work on this issue. Just uh, one uh, simple question. Is anyone asking for this? Have you received any public comments or requests for this uh, type of system? Because I haven't received any. Thank you. Um through the chair. No, we haven't received anything specifically. Um, from a staff perspective, I think just uh, uh, with regard to the planning implications that this may have, um, I think that we will see municipalities starting this conversation early um, in order to have that decision made, that which will inform the rest of the election planning over the next two years. Thank you. Councillor Floyd. Thank you very much and thanks for the presentation on this. Uh, I want to urge everybody who's watching on, uh, on TV or online or in the, in the audience, uh, this is just, we're, we're, we're talking about it. I don't think there's going to be, uh, uh, as Councillor Best mentioned, I don't think there hasn't been a real groundswell of support to, to change our, our voting system. So uh, again, I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> Quick question, I, I guess, with, regarding the, uh, the a, a, a clarification, I guess, as to why we're doing this. This is because the provincial government made changes uh, back in 2016. Uh, if you can sort of uh, expand a little bit on the reason why we're doing it. Again, not because of a huge groundswell of support or uh, 
people on the street telling us we have to change our voting system, but this is something that's provincially mandated. Through the chair, correct. Um, this is an option for council to consider with the election. So um, we did want to have that conversation um, in order for us to have that direction. But um, no, it, the, the reason why we're having that conversation is just that it is something that has been in place since 2016 for municipalities to consider with their elections. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Mayor Kranz and then Councillor Lee. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I knew that this would probably be the real barn burner of the evening here, so let me have a little bit of fun with it for a minute, okay? Uh, some of the uh, questions have already been uh, asked, but uh, it suggests in the next step, staff will bring forward a, a report and recommendation uh, for council. Now, with options and costs and all those nice things, so I guess the first question to Megan is, uh, when do you expect to, uh, to have this come back? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, the Chair. Uh, we are still um, doing some research, um, speaking with other municipalities, so we do anticipate that this wouldn't be coming back to Council um, until uh, the end of March at the earliest at this point. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm not going to comment on how well it uh, worked or didn't work in uh, London and other municipalities around the world. I track it pretty close. So if you're looking for a loser to become a winner, think about that. Not only one individual, but many individuals. If you're on a council of a bunch of losers, go that route is what uh, I would suggest. So, Chairman, I'm not going to start telling staff how to write a report or recommendations. I just want everybody to know, including the public, when this comes back now with options, and I rather suspect there's only two options. You jump into ranked ballot, or you keep it first past the post. That's the only options as far as I know, unless there's other options that I'm not aware of. So right up front, uh, you know, I'm attempting to keep an open mind, but I'm having really difficulty in that. And again, first past the post is, means that you got the majority of the votes. And what's wrong with that? Nothing. A loser becomes a winner. The illustration with three individuals is fairly simple. Using other municipalities where there might be eight or ten. Well, I understand very clearly if there's ten people running, the, the person that's tenth, he or she drops off. Then the ninth person, that loser, could be the winner. So. We should think about that. So other than that, I have no thoughts, no opinions on it. I just don't want to waste a lot of time on it, that's all. And staff time as well, so thank you. Just in case anybody wonders where I'm coming from on it. <laughs> thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Ali. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I 100% concur with everything you said. And also want to uh, bring you to staff's notice that on the same ballot, we have the mayor candidates, we have the councillors, regional councillors, and the trustees. How will we differentiate if the trustees have to be a different system and this has to be a different, right there, then and there, you see that there's a huge flaw there. So, um, like his worship, I want to be on the record by saying I do not support this, will not support it. Just a reminder, we're not voting tonight on anything. We're not even receiving the report, we're just hearing from it. So Councilor Mello, if you're the only one left, might as well. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm looking forward to the report. All the options will be there. Uh, I've been involved in nomination meetings where ranked balloting was used, and it works. The mayor mentioned uh, about losers. We've seen people elected to this council with 28% of the vote. Right? That means 70% of the people voted against that member of council. Okay? So the ranked balloting gives a better indication of what the intention of the voters was. So that's why I favor ranked balloting, but I'll wait for the report to come back, and then we'll, we'll have an opportunity then to debate it. All right, uh, second time around. Councillor Best. Well, not, not a question, so if Megan wants to sit down, I don't think anyone else has any questions. I do have questions, but you can take it from here. I don't care. It doesn't yeah. matter. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate where everybody's uh, coming from, but in my viewpoint, talking uh, to people over a few elections, uh, provincially, federally, municipally, I haven't had one person ask me about this. And secondly, after a recent experience in watching the Iowa caucuses, do we want to repeat? <laughs> 
And third point is, you know, we've got some huge challenges ahead of us. This isn't one of them. I think let's move on, let's hear the report, but I think we can see how this is going. Any other question? There's no report, let's not debate it, but if you have a question, Councillor DiLorenzo, or? Questions or comments? Just questions uh, or comments, let's hold them when the report comes forward, because we have no idea what the report's gonna say. I, I, I realize that others sneaked in the comments, but. Uh, I have a comment, but I. You know uh, what, I to be to fair, the, I did, I did why don't you take a minute? Rules, so. Okay, thank you for that, I appreciate it. I do have a couple of quick questions. Uh, do we know if other municipalities of the region are looking at it? Um, through you. Um, we are not aware of any conversations that have happened at this time or any decisions that have been made, um, but we anticipate that there may be some discussions happening sooner rather than later. Okay, so just one ask is when the report comes forward, can you address that as well? Because uh, Councillor Ali raised the question about multiple options on the same ballot. So it would be, it would be important to know, I think, when the report comes forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, and before closing this, any other questions? Seeing none, and I move my head very quickly. Uh, there is no report, so we're done with this topic. Uh, moving on, the next item is proposed governance changes for Milton Hydro, Hydro Holdings Incorporated. Uh, staff report CORS 00420. I have a motion moved by Councillor Best and seconded by Councillor Melbouf. Uh, so would any member like to comment on a motion? I don't believe there's a staff presentation. There isn't any. I know that uh, our CEO is in the audience, so if you have any questions for uh, him as well, I'm sure Frank can come up and answer them. So any members of the council? Seeing none, I call the questions. All in favor? Oh, Mayor Krantz. Just very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like somebody to uh, share with me uh, the very positives, and I'm gonna support this, but I think the public should be aware of the very positives uh, with uh, this passing, what it means to the municipality, or doesn't mean, because we are the single shareholders, so. Fair question, uh, Mr. CEO or Frank, would you like to come up, sir? Welcome, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I, the benefits really stem from the fact that the Ontario Energy Board, which is our regulator for the distribution side of the business, has indicated that they will be requiring the utilities to comply with some of the changes that they've introduced, which really dealt with the independence of the board members. But in conjunction with that, they also came up with a bunch of recommendations with respect to good board governance. So they actually hired a couple of firms uh, that helped them come up with the report. But it's also based on what good business corporate decision making is like. So they've taken some of those decisions and came out and said that utilities must change. So the basis of that really is to come up with a board of directors who are looking after the best interests, who are, the be who are qualified to make sure they're making the right decisions. And that goes beyond just the technical aspects of it. It's the ability to understand, to comprehend, and to work with the rest of the board. So that's, I think, the benefit to it. The side benefit, if, you've, if you looked at it, is that we have now a growing unregulated business, and we've tried to separate the two boards. So we're now gonna have boards that are dealing with the regulated and a board dealing with the unregulated. Mayor Krantz, anything further? So uh, what the average uh, taxpayer, the average uh, hydro pair, what will he or she see at the end of the day after we pass this? The day after we pass this, they'll see no difference really. Um, but down the road, actually, when we go to our next cost of service, which we do once every five years, in the report, we are recommending that the distribution board be reduced, and therefore the actual cost to the customers will actually go down from that aspect of it. Mr. Chairman, we're starting to drill down now as to the reasons for this. Anything further, Mayor Krantz? All right, seeing then, Councilor DiLorenzo. Um, so I've been a member of Milton Hydro uh, before and also part of and I've seen some of the really high qualified candidates within Milton we've had for uh, board members. So we, we've never had a problem finding very qualified candidates. Um, I, I've seen um, Meg's, the unregulated uh, portion grow, allowing more 
revenue come in and not just on the not just supported by the cost of the hydro revenues but in solar power and wind and others so adding these two extra directors um, I, I read the report I, I, I kind of felt that th this would allow also more um, more focus on the unregulated portion and possibly you know have having more board members um, involved uh, on on boards like like Megs versus the smaller amount of directors, you're, you're more split. I'm trying to see, I'm, I've, I've read this, but I'm trying to see what the mayor is saying is that how, what the effect is on the taxpayer, but I was also looking at the perspective of two board members may allow more um, focus on also the non-regulated uh, portion. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that, that by you, we, right now our eight board members are all on distribution and we take a subset of that that also deals with the unregulated side. The idea here is that we would segregate the two so that the boards can really concentrate on their own aspects that they're interested in. So that would allow us to have five on the regulated side and five on the unregulated side, and they would be concentrating on their own lines of business. So I see this more as a future investment that could get more revenue to Milton Hydro, more revenue to the town, and, and a reduced cost to the taxpayer down the road and the hydro pair. Um, thank you for your presentation or your speech. Any other, any other councillors? Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. Great, thank you. Any comments by the councillors? Seeing none, uh, the motion's on the floor. All in favor? Carries. Next item is item for consideration number two, staff report CORS 00120. I have a motion moved by Councillor Best and seconded by Councillor Malbov. Uh, the motion's in front of you, so I'm not gonna bother reading it. Any, would any member like to comment? Mayor Krantz? Mr. Chairman, a uh, question, and I'm supportive of receiving it for information, but there's a lot of stuff in here. And, uh, and of course, at the uh, meeting back in November there, I questioned, uh, when the solicitor uh, stood up and said that we didn't have an option. Now, from what I understand from this report, we definitely do have options. I just wonder when some of those, uh, I guess, options will be uh, dealt with to put this to rest. And, and I'm also well aware that uh, the boards of education, more particularly the uh, region of Halton is dealing with this as well. So uh, how did they go or do they go hand in hand and uh, Who's going to uh, do the dance and who's going to lead the dance, I guess, is what's important to bring closure to one or two of these files. All right, Glenn, I think. Yes. Um, so the rebate program in front of council tonight would be a program applicable on a townwide basis. So any applicant that meets the definitions that we've described would be eligible for it. Um, as council dictates it. So uh, an important point is the motion that would enact this program is within the body of the report and it would take council moving that motion and approving it. Um, and also within the motion, as the mayor noted, council does have options tonight. Um, we've left a blank space in terms of the percentage and it is within council's discretion to make that up to 100%. We would just need the clarity of the rebate. A really important aspect of the way the program is designed is that it is a rebate program. Development charges still are payable and that ensures that the development charge bylaw is held intact. This rebate would be provided uh, to, the, to the applicant, to the developer in whatever case, um, to basically rebate the town's portion of development charges. And it is specific to the town share. So um, in the particular case of Spring Ridge, there was the complaint hearing in front of council, which was for both the town share and the education share. This policy has been written to address the town's portion of that, uh, um, of that development charge complaint. But again, it would be a rebate to the development charges that have already been paid um, so that from a development charge perspective, we're still in compliance with the act. There is still the matter of the regional development charges. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the complaint has been made to the region and a hearing date will follow the town's decision. So um, there is a separate process that would, uh, that would address that portion of the discussion. Okay, Mayor Krantz. Mr. Chairman, next steps will be what? I do have uh, an amendment that uh, I can read and we'll, we'll go from there. 
All right, so I have a, before I come to you, Councillor Sturston, that's uh, since an amendment on the floor. Uh, there's a motion moved by Councillor Best and seconded by Councillor Tessa Dirksen. I didn't see that before I... <laughs> Uh, be resolved that whereas the town has long been associated with, it, with its agricultural, historic, and cultural roots, and whereas council has supported development as well as the advancement of programs that help highlight the importance of the town's history as an agricultural center and has encouraged tourism and education to support that continued recognition of its past, including existing exemptions from certain charges, and whereas council has determined that additional steps should be taken by the town to highlight the importance of the town's history and cultural connection to agriculture. That a development, therefore, be resolved that a development charge rebate program be approved in accordance with Section 107 of the Municipal Act and as outlined in the program attached in Schedule A with a financial rebate equal to 100% of the town development charges payable for development applications meeting the definition of agricultural tourism building or structure and or museum. Uh, Councillor Best, it's your motion, so did I read it? Is, did I cover yep. all the wording? You, you covered it uh, quite well. I understand staff's uh, uh, situation. This is a highly uh, technical and legal thing, thanks to the province. But uh, just a few points on this, uh, as uh, pointed out by Mr. Hughes when he made his presentation. If these structures are built on the neighboring residential building, they would have received no development charges. Basically, you know, and I think a lot of councillors have already been through some of them. These are no bigger than a gazebo or a pool house or, you know, somebody's covered deck. And I find it ridiculous that here we have a good, you know, corporate citizen and community involved community. And it doesn't matter just, you know, this one, any other agriculture. From what my knowledge and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, there is no capital, you know, you know uh, plans for this area. You're in the middle of the NEC restricted zone. There is no growth. Here, and I don't think the town's got any plans for Bell School Line. Also, in terms of the NEC, they also waive their costs. I can see this, as, you know, I can understand the Treasury staff trying to, you know, to keep the income coming in there, but this is like a one time thing in terms of the amount of uh, requests we would get is maybe one or two times in a term. So I would uh, suggest that uh, council uh, goes along this because if you notice that in any of the town promotions, they include this facility. Councilor Tester Dirksen as a seconder. Thank you, and I'm going to uh, critique my own uh, motion that I've seconded here. Um, as far as the number, um, in the case of Spring Ridge and the complaint that came forward, I 100% agree with Councillor Best. My concern is that we might be creating a slippery slope, um, given that it's rare, uh, true, but when there's rebates available, they tend to become more common, I've, I would think. So without having numbers in front of us as to what the actual financial impact could be, because as we know, and we, it's important to note that what we lose through this program or through these development charges, we have to make up for somewhere else, which is going to be the property tax base. So taxpayers are still going to be covering this. Without knowing the number, um, it's a little bit difficult to arrive at a percentage. So I understand where Councillor Best and myself are coming from with the 100% in this particular case for Spring Ridge because the buildings, well, they're not really even buildings. Um, but I worry about how that could affect future uh, applications to the rebate and are we painting ourselves in a corner um, when it comes to budget time? Glenn, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, so you're absolutely correct that once the program is established, any, any development that comes in meeting the criteria will need to be funded from the town for the portion of the, the development charges. Um, it has been written within the definitions to be very specific so that um, although we can never eliminate the potential that someone will find a creative way of you know, taking advantage of the, of the program, it does speak under museums, for example, that it must be a not-for-profit and there's other criteria. Same thing with the agricultural. It still needs to be the principal use as an agricultural site and that the, re the use has to be related as well. So we have tried to mitigate there. There is absolutely no guarantee that uh, there couldn't be potential for um, you know, broader uses coming. Our history is that, and as noted, there aren't very many of these type of developments. They do occur. Uh, we've seen you know, in each of these cases a couple maybe in the last uh, 10 years. We haven't done an extensive um, review. We have tried to identify ones that we have seen in the past. Predicting is even more difficult in terms of how many sites do we have that where the zoning and the 
uh, uses of the site would allow for this, and that's why we've stopped short of trying to come up with what the future uh, exactly could look like. In this case, we do speak to the impact for this year. If there's, uh, on top of the Spring Ridge, one other site that we're aware of, where we think in total the program will cost about 43000 Based strictly on our 10-year history alone, we know that this year is more the anomaly than the norm. You don't, we don't see enough of that development to see that kind of quantum every single year. And that's really the, the best information we have at this time to hopefully help counsel with the, with the decision. Councillor, you get the floor. Thank you. Uh, just as you were speaking, I'm, I was listening and also thinking, um, would it be possible to have a sliding scale instead of a maximum up to 100%? But then I am recognizing you would have to have other criteria as to where they would fit on that sliding scale, which would be more work and more complexity. But is that something you turned your mind to? We didn't look at a sliding scale. Um, if Council has an appetite, we could always go back and just double check that we're not going over any boundaries. If we talk about a limit, um, I think that would be easier to implement than a sliding scale to say, you know, this is the framework up to a certain dollar value. I just want to make sure that I'm not overlooking any sort of legislative hurdles that that might create. But it would give Council more certainty as to, you know, the, the extent of potential exposure that it might be creating. In kind of the same way, if you look at our existing development charge bylaw, there is an exemption for this kind of use at an agricultural site. It's, it's limited to a number of square, square meters, essentially. So whether this kind of program should have a similar limit, it would be one potential way to mitigate from Council's perspective. Uh, well, I'm not sure if that would require an amendment to the amended motion proposed, but I... I think that would give us some more flexibility, to be honest, rather than having the applications for the rebates coming forward by default at 100%. I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure what the appetite is for that among my colleagues at this point. I know we'd like to get this resolved. And uh, if I can just add, if, if we are to look at going that route in the language, I would like to, if we can, have the opportunity just to take that back and make sure that um, we're framing it in a way that our, our legal counsel is comfortable with as well, if that's all right. All right, uh, Councillor Best. Just on that, if the staff want to uh, amend that, I agree with uh, Councillor Tesser Dirksen that in future, any other ones, we'd, we'd have a sliding scale, it makes sense. But uh, just remember that we already have a 50% uh, exemption for industrial expansions, which is, you know, and talking in the millions of dollars. So $43,000 is very cheap. And just remember, uh, if this was any other building, uh, it would even qualify because it's not inhabitable. All right, before I speak, any other councillor? Uh, Mayor Best, uh, Mayor Krantz. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I understand the, uh, the resolution there, I don't think there's any mention of uh, Spring Ridge uh, Farm in that resolution, as I recall. And I think that's really what we're uh, dealing with. And again, I understand very clearly the, uh, the slippery slope thing, and, you know, and I know how that works, uh, too. Uh, but shouldn't each one of them be dealt with on their own merit? I would suspect regardless whether there's a sliding scale or not, and I have no problem with a sliding scale on that, but that becomes interesting. Does it become 75% or 71% or 2%? So I think we've got to be careful of uh, some of that with a precedent that we may or may not set. Uh, I'm not fearful of uh, precedent, like I say, dealing with each one on their own merit in the Spring Ridge when it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned on the 100%. Uh, so, you know, and I'm just wondering aloud, Mr. Chairman, if Spring Ridge should be mentioned in that uh, with that 100%. And, and I ask that question. I don't know whether it's wise or otherwise. So I just ask that question maybe to staff. Yeah, Mr. CFO. Uh, it's intentional that the motions don't speak to any specific site or location because we're be trying to be mindful of the fact that in order to comply with the Municipal Act, it needs to be a program that's town-wide and applicable to anyone who meets the definition and criteria as established by Council. Um, we need to stay away from focusing in on too specific of, a, of an application for those reasons. At least as far as, far as I'm concerned, dealing with each one on its own merit would fall into that category if we were approached by someone else for consideration. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I think I have a way of taking it, but Councillor Best. 
Uh, just on that, I can understand the, both positions, but uh, if necessary, I, I'm willing to amend it to it on a case-by-case -case basis because I agree with the mayor. You know, there, there is such a unique situations here that, you know, you're talking agritourism. At the most, I can count three places in all of Milton. And in museums, we've got one that uh, isn't government operated. So, uh, you know, we talk, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, other people have their own priorities here too, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can see this coming back, you know, in basically any future operation. We, we do that on a case by case because, you know, there's different uh, criteria here, and I appreciate the staff that, you know, this is a highly complex situation. You don't want to create a precedent, but that's what we do every day. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to reiterate, so our recommendation would be to have it a criteria-based program, and if the concern is that the size of the program could grow beyond what we're comfortable financially, I think our better approach would be to talk about the criteria as in front of you with a limit maybe introduced as opposed to anything that gets into that case-by-case -case review, especially if it's not supported by very clear criteria that would be open to any applicant. If I may, uh, what does the council think about sending it back to staff because they've heard from all of us and having them come back with something that doesn't come back to bite us later because they can look at legal opinion and actually come back with something more meaningful. Because uh, I have the same concerns that uh, Mayor Kranz raised. Uh, I don't think we've dealt with a lot at all, so it's a very rare thing. I'm completely comfortable with looking at it and making a decision when it comes up. My, my concern is that when we put a rule like this in place, we create incentives for people to game the system. Uh, and I, as soon as I read the report, I started thinking of all the possible cases where people would try to present whatever they're trying to do as a museum so they can get away with it. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, would you... Would, uh, I'm gonna look at the clerk. Is this something we can send back to staff? Do we need a vote for deferral or? All right, procedural vote for deferral uh, to next month perhaps. Anyone wants to move it? Councilor Melbouf, Councilor Tessa Dirksen seconding it. All in favor? And that carries. So we'll, we'll discuss it next month. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mayor Kranz. Could I uh, suggest as well uh, that staff attempt to find out where the region and the boards of education is on uh, this before we deal with it? I think that might be important as well. Mr. Seifo, do you want to? We can. I should clarify with the board of education. Um, from their perspective, it's strictly with council's decision on the hearing, which we're, we've currently recessed until council comes back to revisit the hearing. The region, it's a separate process, so we can get an update on that as well. All right, thank you. Moving on. Uh, the 2020 allocation program, so staff report PD00720, that's item for consideration number three. I have a motion to move the report recommendation, which has been moved by Councillor Bess and seconded by Councillor Malboff. Uh, I'm not going to read the report out loud because you have it in front of you. So any, would any members of council what, like to comment or ask questions? Seeing none, all in favor? And that carries. All right, now we have a uh, councillor motion, but before we deal with it, we have to deal with the motion to waive the rules of procedure. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, in order to Sorry, how many, do we need majority or two-thirds? So we need two-thirds vote uh, to waive the procedure. And that motion has been moved by Councillor Cluett and seconded by Councillor Ali. So any, is Councillor Malbuff? I don't wanna belay this issue, but again, I won't be supporting the waiver to waive procedure on this. The intent of waiving procedure on notice of motions at the same meeting, that it is presented is to be used only when it's a time sensitive issue. This isn't. Okay? I mean, <clears throat> it's a report to come back in September. Even if we deal with this at the next council meeting in, in March, that still leaves staff six months to look at this. And again, the majority of the information staff is already doing, the ridership numbers are there. Six months is more than enough time. So, my problem it's a, it's a matter of principle. We have procedural bylaws for a reason. Notice of motions is to give staff time to take a look at what's coming forward, give members of council an opportunity to look what's being proposed, so that when we deal with it at the next council meeting, we can make an informed decision. So I would ask council, again, this is not a time-sensitive issue. 
Okay. We can deal with it in March. Let's follow our procedural bylaws and deal with it at the next council meeting as we're supposed to. All right, uh, Stuart, so Councillor Melbove, Councillor Cluett. Uh, just thanks to, uh, thanks Mr. Chair, just to, to respond. This is more along the lines of staff direction and according to our procedural bylaws, um, and I know this is sort of a grayish area in our procedural bylaws, uh, this is staff direction and usually staff direction notices a motion are heard at the beginning and uh, heard, heard right away. This isn't just simply someone's rounding up ridership numbers. This is community engagement that we're asking for and that's why I want to make sure that staff has enough time to talk to interest groups, whether it be seniors, whether it be our Milton Youth Advisory Committee or whether it be people on the street or whatever they choose to do and to come up with some kind of a marketing plan uh, in, a, in the short term basis uh, in order to help market Saturday transit. One of the, and I'll, I'll save my future comments as we're just talking about the, uh, the, the waiver of the rules. The, the, that's essentially the reason why we're doing it is we're just making sure that staff has sufficient amount of time. All right, let's not, uh, so Councillor Best, go ahead. Uh, but just on the topic of the waiver of procedure, please. Just a point of clarification, Mr. Chairman. Looking at the uh, motion, it states the introduction dates February 10th and the consideration dates February 6th. Is this a typo or are we going back in time? It's a typo, but good enough. Just, good, just, just yeah. checking. All right, so Councillor Lorenzo, just the waiving the procedure. So, so just talking on the waiver. So I, I echo partially what Councillor Malbuff said. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I agree. We, we didn't always have this a, a notice period before the motion. Um, we, you know, it's always hasn't been like this, but we, one of the reasons why I implement this is Councillor Melvoff is right to give staff some more time, but also to, you know, so we don't, um, this might be the wrong word, but we don't ambush council or the public on information, but I don't see this as an ambush. It's just asking for, you know, a future report to come back. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't feel that this is like, a shocker or a surprise to me or I don't have enough time to, to review it. So, you know, we have a way to waive it um, when it's reasonable. And, and I think that in this instance, it is reasonable for council to waive it and, and vote on this today for that future report. So I, I am in support of that, of that waiver. All right, Councillor Ali, and then I'm calling the question. All right, Councillor Ali said no, so I'm calling the question because we've already lost all members of public here. Uh, all in favor of waiving the rules of procedure. One, two, three, four, five. Five fails, sorry guys. How many passed? Recorded vote. Good call, councillors. So, all in favor of waiving the procedure, please stand. Are you going to read the names, or? Um, in favor, Councillor Cluett, Councillor Ali, Councillor Di Lorenzo, Councillor Tessar Dirksen, Mayor Krantz, Councillor Hamid. That carries. <laughs> All opposed, good call again. Opposed, Councillor Best, Councillor Malbo. Thank you for the reminder, Mayor Krantz, actually I should have uh, done that. And uh, everyone else who's paying attention, this is how you use the uh, rules and procedure to your favor. Uh, so uh, we have a motion uh, moved by Councillor Kluwit regarding Terry Transit Service, uh, seconded by Councillor Ali. So uh, Councillor Kluwit is a mover and then Councillor Ali is a seconder. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks to Council for uh, moving this forward. Um, basically, uh, in the spirit of continuing on with our, our core services review and in the spirit of, of, of review of our services, um, one of the things that we have found ourselves year upon year upon year the last several years is a line item in the blue sheets of our budget talking about cancelling Saturday transit. And one of the questions, many of the questions that pop up during that, these deliberations are, is what have we done to fix it? What have we done to improve the service? What have we done to market it? And those questions go into the big hallowed halls of here of Milton Town Council, with no staff direction, and uh, end up being repeated every single budget. This is asking staff to come up with 
uh, some marketing ideas, some things that we can do via our communications department, social media, uh, some other ways of, uh, of reaching out to user groups. Uh, we did one very similar at the budget uh, regarding uh, seniors and looking at some options for seniors transit throughout the town of Milton. And you know, the, the Milton Public Library is an, another great resource of information, uh, knowledge, and input from people who do use Saturday trans, uh, who do use transit, and what would help them utilize Saturday transit. We might be able to get some answers there. It's just asking them to do a little bit of work that they normally would be doing, sort of formalizing the process, but moving forward and coming back to council uh, again, uh, the deadline of September to give it enough time for us to consider it during the budget deliberation and the budget call reports. That's the reason why we wanted to move it forward now and uh, to look back at uh, you know, further recommendations of what we can do with Saturday transit, maybe utilize some of these ideas with regular transit and to come back and if there's any potential budget impacts then we can have that in front of us before the next uh, budget there. So um, that's all I really have to say, but it's just formalizing, asking them to do, to do what we normally are doing and to consult with the public and let's move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Eliza Seconder. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to my colleague for raising his concerns about, you know, procedures and waiving um, of procedures. And I take that and I will be careful next time um, and only use it when it's necessary and it's time sensitive. So having said that, I want to thank Councillor Cluett for involving me in this discussion and for giving me the opportunity to second this motion. And I look forward to working with the Milton Youth Committee and uh, to get some important ridership feedback that can help uh, improve uh, our Saturday ridership. Thank you. And Councillor Best. Yes, well, uh, staff are at that. Uh, could they also uh, check with their comparators? I was just uh, noting of our uh, 12 comparators, uh, only one uh, Guelph doesn't have uh, a similar weekend service and ask you know, what their best practices are because uh, when we're looking at the populations between 100 to 150,000, they seem to be doing far better, especially the, if everyone's seen the publicity about Kingston. They're, you know, they're doing a lot more uh, activities you know, throughout the week. So let's see what we can do and learn rather than have to uh, you know, basically uh, keep repeating ourselves and trying to find out. And I agree with Councillor Claude, aren't we? We seem to go through this with a certain pool in the Rotary Park. Thank you for that. Uh, Mayor Krantz. Mr. Chairman, I'm certainly supportive of what I believe to be the intent here, but I'm just wondering the first whereas and the last whereas, uh, where you talk about e efficient, effective, and accountable, those are all great. But I'd like to see inserted in there financial, uh, finance, finances. And with the last one, you know, uh, to deliver as, e as efficiently, I'd like to see in there, and financially uh, as possible. So just a friendly suggestion uh, there, because we really are, and we have to keep our eye on the uh, the bottom line of this. So I just like to see, you know, being financially accountable as well in the whereas. -es. The clerk is looking at uh, wording just it, a but friendly thought for the mover yeah. and seconder. Well, while the clerk's looking at it, I think the mover and seconder got a gist of it. So, Councillor Lloyd? Absolutely uh, agree and uh, great suggestion to put it in. Councillor Lee? Absolutely agree. All right, the amendment is in and we'll figure out very soon what it is actually. Uh, Councillor Melba, if I didn't see your hand, but I assume you have a word to say. Yeah, the, uh, the mayor dealt with what I was going to raise and that was as part of this report and that comes back that the financial impacts be looked at uh, in a greater detail than we have been doing in the past. So again, uh, as I said, you know, my question is, why hasn't staff been doing this all along? Because this is basically what they're supposed to be doing. So again, uh, <clears throat> I think they have been working on this. Okay? Like I said, the numbers are there. Uh, staff is looking constantly on how to improve transit. So again, uh, <clears throat> the motion will pass. We'll go through this whole thing. And back in September, we'll debate this thing again. And we won't do anything about it. Always the optimist. Uh, any other first time speaker? Uh, seeing none, Councillor Ali. I just wanted to point out the fact that this does not take away from the need for regional transit. So that is something that we need to make our first priority. I want to say that as many chances as I get to say that. 
Fair point. Uh, any other speakers? All right, so I have the wording on uh, Mayor Cran's friendly amendment. Uh, be it resolved, whereas the delivery of efficient, effective, and financially accountable transit service, so that's financially added there, as well as on the third whereas, and whereas Milton Town Council strives to ensure all services, including public transit, is delivered as efficiently and financially accountably as possible. So there are uh, two, uh, the first whereas as well as second whereas, we've added financially accountable in both areas. Is that uh, is, does that cover it, Mayor Kranz? And up, oh, I'm seeing nodded heads. So the motion's on the floor. All in favor. And that carries. And uh, I think that's all we have in the open session. So any regional council update before I uh, get Mayor, uh, Councilor Bass. Yeah, just a, a quick item for uh, local councillors that uh, we, the regional councillors received our uh, capital plans for uh, 2020, and I'm glad to see we're finally making some progress on that. We have a full day, by the looks of it, on Wednesday coming up regarding the AMO work that I'm doing. I had some meetings at Queen's Park last week and expect some new legislation coming down soon. So as, as the CAO uh, knows, that uh, we could be very busy the next few months. So th this is going to reprieve. So so enjoy the short meetings while you've got it, because I think we're going to make up for it in May and June. Uh, Council Velpo or uh, Cluid or McCranz, anything? Seeing none, uh, we do have a confidential uh, report now. I just want to make sure if no member wants to go into the closed session, then we can uh, get a mover here and deal with it. Uh, Seeing then, Councillor Melbov uh, is moving to deal with the report, not to go to the open session. Any seconder? We already. So we have two separate reports, and I'm assuming nobody wants to go to the closed session for either of them. Uh, Councillor Best and Councillor Melbourne are movers and seconders of both reports, so we'll deal with them together or one at a time. All right. The number is not written. Oh, there we go. So the first report is be resolved that the recommendation contains a staff report ENG 00120 be approved. There will be no discussion. Uh, all in favor? And that carries. And the second report is that the recommendation continues staff report ENG 002-10 be approved. Again, no discussion. All in favor? And that carries as well. All right, uh, I have a motion moved by Councillor Best and seconded by Councillor Malbouf. Be it resolved that bylaw numbers 005-2020, 006-2020, 007-2020, and 008-2020 uh, be read, passed, and numbered. And that the mayor and the town clerk be authorized to sign the said bylaws, seal them with the seal of the corporation, and that they be engrossed in the bylaw book. All in favor? And that carries. And I believe that is it. All right, thank you, members of the council. Go home.